Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Karen Sander, the Director of Public Programs for the CUNY Graduate Center, and we are so delighted to have you join us here tonight for what promises to be an important and lively conversation on a most timely topic. I would like to offer a welcome to those of you who are here in person, but also to our large online audience who are tuning in from across the country. One of the silver linings from the pandemic has been that people from around the world are now attending the CUNY Graduate Center public events, and we welcome all of you online tonight to this wonderful program. One of the things that makes New York City and New York State great is our incredible public spaces. Places that connect people from all walks of life, places that provide a place to gather, places that enhance civic life and democracy, places that provide tranquility, and places that sometimes just take our breath away and make us feel alive. Tonight, we will look at the intentionality behind creating and maintaining these public spaces. Why are they important, and how can we make them work better? We have a terrific group of experts to help us delve into these topics, and it is my great pleasure now to introduce them. First off, in the middle there, we have Setha Lowe, who is the Distinguished Professor of Environmental Psychology, Geography, Anthropology, and Women's Studies here at the CUNY Graduate Center, and is also the Director of the Graduate Center's Public Space Research Group, an important collective of faculty and students putting out some of the most significant knowledge about public space. Setha has written many articles and books on the importance of public space, and is regularly quoted in media sources around the country. Her new book, Why Public Space Matters, published by Oxford, and is the impetus for this evening's discussion. You'll hear a lot about this fascinating book tonight, and I encourage all of you to read it. Next to Setha, we have Susan Donahue, the New York City Parks Commissioner. She became commissioner in February 2022, and prior to that, she served as president of Prospect Park Alliance, where she set the vision and overall strategy for Prospect Park, Brooklyn's flagship 585-acre park, while she also led the day-to-day -day operations of the park. During her tenure, she raised over $130 million for crucial capital improvements to the park. Prior to that, she served as senior advisor and assistant commissioner at New York City Parks, where she played a leadership role in Play New York City, Mayor Bloomberg's blueprint for enhancing the city's sustainability. Um, next, in the last chair, we have Eric Kulisade, who is the commissioner of the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. He has served as commissioner since 2019, leading state parks through the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as major capital initiatives, including opening the new Shirley Chisholm State Park in Brooklyn, an award-winning rebuilding project in Niagara Falls, the new Jones Beach Energy and Nature Center on Long Island, and Autism Nature Trail in Letchworth State Park, a first of its kind trail designed specifically for people on the autism spectrum and their families. Previously, Eric served as Senior Vice President, Parks and Policy Program for the Open Space Institute and also as Deputy Commissioner for Open Space Production at State Parks. He led the state team that oversaw the successful public-private effort to convert an abandoned railroad bridge in Poughkeepsie into the walkway over the Hudson State Historic Park. And, last but not least, is our moderator for the evening, David Burney, who is the co-founder and director of the Urban Placemaking and Management Program at the Pratt Institute School of Architecture. The Graduate MS Program is the first in the country to focus on the emerging field of placemaking as an approach to urban and community design. Mr. Burney served as a member of the New York City Planning Commission from 2019 to 2022, as the commissioner of the New York City Department of Design and Construction, and also as chief architect of the New York City Housing Authority from 1990 to 2004. Before I turn over the stage to our incredible panel, uh, a quick note about tonight's format. Our panel will converse until around 7.30, and then we will open for questions from the audience until 7.45, and you can use the mics on the side aisles to ask your questions. Um, it's my great pleasure now to turn it over to you, David. Thank you. Hello? Hello? And 
push the little button up. There we go, that's it. Oh. <laughs> so I think I'd like to start, since we are focusing tonight on um, the park systems and research, social research about the parks, to have Setha say a few words about her experience with the research that she's been doing on the various parks that's in the book, and that will kind of get us started and we can, we can go from there. So does that make sense, Setha? Uh, yeah. Thank you. First, let's just say hi to everybody and thank you so much for coming. It's really, I'm so pleased to have you all here, especially the two commissioners and my good colleague and um, David Burney and mentor, I would say, in some ways. And uh, thanks to everyone who came out to support us this evening. Um, the book was written, David, first and foremost, was it, the general idea was to really try to illustrate um, from an evidence-based uh, evidence point of view that public space does a huge number of things. And though we may focus on parks today, I think one of the takeaways is that I don't think that there's any urban resource that is so valuable as public space, so much so that now I find myself advocating for designing cities only around the public space. And it really doesn't matter, you know, if you're interested in sustainability, uh, public space adds to that, or whether you're interested in sociability or cultural continuity, or if you're interested in the economy and work and informal workers, or the integration of immigrants, or if you're interested in um, health and well-being. We now know that our parks and public spaces make all the difference. And we know from COVID so much um, that loneliness, mental health, and well-being is really dependent on these public spaces as places for people to gather and come together. And we learned also from Black Lives Matter, of course, how incredibly important public spaces are for social justice and for equity and a sense of belonging in the city. So that's sort of the big panorama, and, and that was um, really why I wrote the book. But the book is made up of, as you say, particular ethnographies of parks, um, in which me, uh, which with my students, some of whom I believe here are in the audience tonight, um, uh, we went into parks, and, for Eric, for, for actually the city of New York, and study them ethnographically to really see why people care about parks and how these incredible uh, benefits or contributions of public uh, space take place. Why the ethnography, why the field research is so important is that it's one thing, I mean, we have lots of numbers and we can prove in some way um, how many people get better if they walk in a park. But it's another thing to truly understand the dynamics of why people go to a park, what they experience there, and how it creates a change in them to walk or to feel better, and that that is what ethnography and the kind of research I'm doing, so that you were just saying that Eric over, uh, oversaw a walkway over the Hudson, and I use that as an example, as, as he knows, for really demonstrating how a, a walkway, essentially a linear park that was on an old railroad uh, between two towns that were in tough shape and, and with lots of deterioration, Poughkeepsie and Highland, but how it both stimulated the resilience of those towns, but also brought people out and completely changed the health and well-being sort of spectrum and made the place feel safe. Or I look at Prospect Park, for example, which I know Susan knows really intimate, intimately. And I don't know that we think about all the people who work in Prospect Park, all the nannies and the caretakers. Do we think about all the, the sustainability, the ecological services that the park gives us? Do we think, of course, about the importance of children play and creativity? And still, probably even most importantly, do we think about it as a center of cultural continuity, collective memory, sense of belonging to the city. So that by doing research in individual parks, and again, in the book, I also work in India and, um, and Kenya and very heavily in Latin America, uh, in Costa Rica, really trying to show how public space actually generates these very positive effects. Because ultimately what I'm arguing is public space increases individual, 
group, neighborhood, even city flourishing for everyone. And it does it in a very complex way between contact, public culture, and what I call affective atmosphere. And if you have these right ingredients and you can design and promote for these ingredients, um, then you actually can create environments that give so much back to the city that it is, from my point of view, of shame, a pity, um, uh, of, uh, uh, I don't even know the right word, that we don't invest more public money in it because the return, particularly for marginalized communities, particularly for vulnerable populations, children and older people, um, it makes all the difference in the world, and it makes all the difference, of course, even in terms of climate change. Is that? So you um, used your research in a way that I think is rarely done, actually, uh, looking at specific locations, ethnography that's yeah. often not available. Um, so that's produced a lot of really interesting um, data. And I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of the case studies that, that you've done, particularly the local ones like Prospect Park and Jones Beach and Lake Welsh and uh, Tompkins Square Park, are there a couple of takeaways from that research that you would say stand up above all the rest? And I don't just mean, oh, we need more money, which we do. <laughs> we uh, do need more money. <laughs> but are there, you know, just based on the ethnography, are there a couple of things that you think really shine out and stand out? Well, that's really, that's a good question. I, I mean, I think overall, um, David, what I decided to do um, was to develop this social justice and public space framework that kind of summarized what I felt were the pieces that really made the parks work. So Prospect Park, let's say, or Walkway, which is different, but that there were, is there enough space for everyone? Does everyone have a voice in what the park will be? Is there a sense of care? Is there fair interaction between individuals? These are all dimensions of justice that I talk about that we could actually use uh, both to create our parks, but also to evaluate whether our parks are working. And, and out of that then comes a number of solutions or observations that, yes, there does need to be recognition of difference. And how do we do that? Often through representation. If you see people who look like you there, if you see symbols of your histories, if you um, participate in food or whatever, these are things that really people see as welcoming. If there are events that are inclusive, we can make our spaces more inclusive. And of course, there's the reverse. I also talk a lot in the book about all the things that that in fact exclude people or make them feel excluded or not welcomed. And those are things that we've been struggling with even here in New York City, having to do with certain forms of privatization, um, certain forms of hostile architecture and design that do not in fact then create the kind of public culture, effective atmosphere, contact that we're looking for. Um, and it requires a lot of thought, a lot of community participation, um, and, and money, to be honest, in many cases. Though some things, not so much money, because a lot of New York has been transformed through the Department of Transportation Interventions, which has given us new kinds of spaces. And I don't know so much about the state parks. Most of the things that I've looked at have cost money, but a place like Jones Beach that is so iconic, it's the people themselves coming together that create a kind of environment that it represents America to the people that you interview. And when you interview people, they tell you that it matters that it's public. I think I guess I should say that. I did ask that question, does it matter? What if this were private? And they say no. If it were private, it would only be for the highfalutin. And uh, it needs to be public f for us all to be here. So, so just following up on that issue of, of, of publicness and social justice and, you know, I mean, Sue, I've spent a lot of time in Prospect Park, and, and as you well know, it's often contested space, right? There are rival groups. The, the picnickers don't like the dog owners, and the dog walkers don't like the picnickers, and the ball players don't like the, anyway, and so on. So as an administrator, uh, and I'm sure you're fully aware of these contests, how do you actually manage that and broker that uh, aspect of social justice in your park? 
Thank you, David, and such a good question. And I wanna just first start off by really thanking Setha for the book and just for the whole, you know, really promoting this sense of um, why public space matters. It's critically important to my work, to Eric's work, that there is that awareness that public space really matters. I mean, we are uh, constantly out there, you know, kind of drumming, the, uh, drumming up for, you know, public space, it's critical infrastructure, it's not just nice to have, it's not just aesthetically pleasing, it is important on so many levels for health and well-being and so many of the things Setha talked about. So first off, just thank you for having me here and I'm so pleased to be talking about this book and this subject in particular. Um, David, your question is such a good one and I think that is so apt. It's across the park system. It is, and now in my role as commissioner, um, balancing, you know, competing uses is one of the great challenges of managing public space, whether you're a park administrator or a commissioner. Um, there are so many competing uses, but I would argue that even in that, and you saw it in Prospect Park, it's amazing in a way, right, that even with all of those different identities and personalities and cultures and desires that people have for use of parks, somehow it largely works. It is, you know, um, parks are amazing gathering places is where we see all kinds of different cultures and identities flourish. And so that balancing act is about, one, making sure that people feel heard. In Prospect Park, we had a very active community committee that I, as an administrator, we met once a month. And uh, what we found, and it was the idea behind the community committee was that you had to represent a group. It wasn't just individual issues, but it was the dog owners and the cyclists <laughs> and the pedestrian groups and the runners and all sitting around the table. And what you find is that, you know, your argument gets a little less strident when you're sitting across from someone who says, but wait, what about me? Like, and, you know, just having people understand both the constraints that we as park administrators are operating under and what we're trying to balance and kind of getting people in the same room. And, the, and it doesn't mean we're all going to agree and there's going to continue to be arguments, but we do the best we can to balance those competing uses. And it's, it, it's by things like, you know, the, I, you know, in Prospect Park, it was often the cyclists versus the pedestrians. And so, you know, we'd have bike races and they'd start at five o'clock or 5.30 in the morning. So that to have that activity early um, and hopefully have that activity end by the time more park com users are coming. Um, so it's about bringing people together, involving the community of users in the conversation, and then trying to reflect those competing needs and balancing those competing needs by thinking about the programming, thinking about how we can time things so that it best works for people, and being thoughtful about that use of public space. The other thing is, is a really very specific effort around making people feel welcome, and part of the dialogue and part of the conversation is so important. Not easy to do, but you know, making sure that people's ideas and thoughts are reflected in the program, in what we are um, you know, permitting what's going on in the park. One thing, though, also to remember always is that even sometimes if there's conflict, and this is where I'm pushing back a little bit on David, because there is a little conflict sometimes Absolutely. in Prosper Park, and some of that conflict is good because one thing about conflict means there's a problem to be solved. And when people come together either to solve the problem or fight about the problem, it is a way, a kind of publicness that is, is vital, I think. And, and to, to always think that, that we're going to be able to accommodate, but to, to, to have a, a park like Prospect Park be a place where there can be dissent, also can be very productive. Absolutely, right? there's no question. Really, really right. productive. When, when my dog's choking on a chicken bone, I don't find it very productive. All right, no, no. But All we'll right. talk well, later. But, but, well, I was thinking about arguments about um, barbecuing, since I live right on the park at 8th Street, so. Uh, I think I think arguing loudly about some things okay. are useful. What do you think? I, I would only add the uh, you know the bird lovers and the cat lovers right. you know, for for us. You have. Those. I mean, I think you know the, the issues are totally true for us. We've obviously learned during the pandemic also right when people f flooded the parks and you really had huge issues and you had safety issues and on top of that you had to you had to deal with. Um, but I would say you know fortunately in the state parks, even the ones around the city, you know they're large enough that people can sort of 
find their place, right? People can find their place. That I think you know, one of the things I loved about the book was in, in the story about Jones Beach, how people just find their place in that land. In the, in the, you know, if you want to be remote, you take your cooler and you hike a long way out there, and you don't get bathrooms, but you get your you get your privacy, right? So, and that's the great. That I think that's the great. That's a great privilege for us that the city doesn't necessarily have, right? Is that we are able to sort of absorb a lot of people, and and, and in those ring, in those parks that are around New York City, in the, in the you know, Jones Beaches, the Harrimans, the the Fonstocks, the FDRs, those are places where they are true urban parks on a weekend, and and that and you're seeing lots and lots of, of people from the city looking for a different kind of um, experience, right? This is their sort of destination parks, they are day trips and. Uh, and they come, and, and, but even there, all the things you said about finding yourself representation, those places are rich because people find themselves in these parks. And so, in fact, you know, obviously, in many ways, as you said, people, these conflicts are natural because people do gravitate to each other in these, in these places, right? They actually sort of seek each other out, and you have conflicts over music, the loudness of music, and all those kinds of things. But it's a, it's a, it is an extraordinary mix, that's for sure. Always want to uh, smile at Dave and say conflict can be. I I think we shy away from conflict, especially when we talk about public space. And yet sometimes I think some of some of the change that we've seen has come out of people, you know, saying this isn't working and you know that there is some kind of conflict. And we're suddenly looking at a new problem. Um, it's an, another argument for more space as well, because one of the ways you resolve that conflict, like Eric says, you can walk out to the end, but you've got to have an end to walk to, right? You need more more space to do that. And I, I remember doing a, a study in Fort Green Park where there was a conflict between people who wanted a, a park to be a, a tranquil place of retreat and people who wanted activities and programming. But Fort Green Park's just about big enough where you can accommodate both those things. But if you have a tiny little pocket park, then the, the tensions uh, become greater, don't they? So. I, you know, I think it's also amazing in this time, and the city's doing it also, where we are, we are rethinking what parkland is, right? I mean, when you think about Fresh Kills or, or Shirley Chisholm, right? These days, you know, we, we need the space. We need to find places for people to go. And so these landfills have become places where people find the, the outdoor experience that uh, can't find everywhere. Right. And out of, as you said, Eric, out of necessity, and to David's point, we need more open space. We know that. So whether it be, you know, from the Bloomberg administration and the schoolyards to playgrounds initiative that opened up, you know, schoolyards that were closed in the past to community use after school hours and into the evenings to using DEP shaft sites that were heretofore wouldn't have been, people wouldn't have think of them as parks, but they can actually be both because you can have it be that DEP can get in for the maintenance, but we can have green space, um, you know, to thinking about streets and the connections to and streets the connections. and, you know, how we're reopening up our parks and being more welcoming. Um, there's some really interesting things happening with, you know, the idea of a linear park on a street, like at 34th Avenue in Queens and what they're doing there, where they're really, because of a closed street, creating more of a park-like experience. I mean, that's what we need to do, is be as innovative as possible. And I think the, um, the COVID experience only added to that, didn't it? Because I remember, you know, in the early days of COVID, everybody was like, stay home, don't go out, you know, everyone's locked in. And then all of a sudden, everybody go outside <laughs> to the street, to the parks. Uh, and the pressure on public space, and parks in particular, became uh, really, you know, multiplied multiple times. So um, I just wonder what lessons have we learned from that? Because we know that's probably not the last pandemic we'll ever face. And it's elevated that social and physical need for public space in a way that we hadn't really uh, understood so much before. So do we think that's created a, a permanent mindset in how we think about public space and parks? I mean, I would just say for us, I, th I mean, having, uh, you know, I was commissioner at the time when, when it came on, and, and the fear, right, in our staffs, our staff, I mean, while, while we were sending everyone home in the offices, everyone in the whole, whole offices went home, but we still asked our park workers to show up in the parks and, and uh, welcome people. I think, I, think, I think we've gained a lot of confidence, and I'm sure the city has, that, that we can do this, right, that we can, that, that you know, yeah. the parks ended up being safe places. I think, though, you do wonder, though, that, that mem memory loss happens, right? And and how long, how do you how do you maintain how do you institutionalize these memories? Because um, it was so vital, and we had people, you know, who were disobeying that don't travel very far because they were coming. They came into the parks. They came from New Jersey because New Jersey closed all their parks. You know, it was a crazy time. But I think we we learned that we can do it. And these places where people who were working in the hospitals and nurses who who needed our parks, especially to to find a bit of respite, right? 
Yeah, I think that the, the, the bit of research that I was able to do during COVID, which really opened my eyes, and probably uh, the book is two years later than it would have been because of COVID, but it seemed important to address it, is that I was looking at the ways that public space expanded and contracted and expanded and contracted. And I do think that once we figured out we could be outside, the networking of space, spaces were used for everything, right? Does everyone remember that we used public space for everything? It was our schools, it was where we played, it's where community meetings, Everything was taking place in public space, and it really um, it brought back that kind of sense of community that was so lacking from the loss of our third spaces. Those are our bars and our restaurants and coffee shops, where the, 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 our churches or whether where we weren't going in that were internal, but that these same kinds of new relationships were being created in our parks, so that. I think, Eric, you might be right, that we should be, there's a chapter in here that sort of talks about the social dysfunction and the stigma and labeling that went on with people who went outside with masks and went out with masks, without masks. I think that it would be really important to look at our public spaces and look at our parks now and write some rules and regulations or whatever or think about it a little better because we had seniors, older people really scared to go out on the street and on the sidewalk. We had people not able to figure out how to get to a park. And then within the park, we had um, all kinds of activities occurring, some which were not as healthy as others and conflicts there. So it would be incredible to take some of what what we've learned and codify it or, I don't know, put it somewhere, because I hadn't thought of it. You think we're really going to forget? <laughs> oh, um, I can't I, forget. I, I, um, along the lines of lessons learned and remembering, I mean, to Eric's point, you know, it very much um, front and center, center for me being at Prospect Park and now being the commissioner was that sense of our, our park workers having to be out there and dealing with the public every day. And they were scared and they were dealing with difficult situation. So coming into this role as commissioner, it was really important for me to acknowledge and recognize that or celebrate our park workers. We actually have launched um, an oral history project of our park workers and their experience through the pandemic. We have a podcast, it's, um, you can find it if you go on NYC Parks, and, um, um, that, that has our, our, some of our staff talking about what it was like to be out there and on the front lines, because we felt it was really important to memorialize that, and the work that they did and being on the front lines was not easy. So I think to Eric's point, we learned we could do it, but we learned also that it had a significant impact on our staff, and we need to continue to support and acknowledge that and celebrate those folks who were out there every day and, and making our park spaces um, available and accessible. Um, but I really believe that in a, in a strange way, COVID was good for parks in the sense that it did raise awareness. I think as New Yorkers, we tend to take our public spaces, or we did prior to COVID, take our public spaces for granted. And I think COVID changed that dramatically. I think people saw so clearly just how important our parks and open spaces were for everything. Well, including triage. I mean, do you realize that parks were in, at least here in New York City, where that's where masks were being handed Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Water was being handed yeah. We were doing triage centers. I mean, they became Food distribution medical. sites. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, testing, testing centers. Testing centers. And yeah. remember, public space is things we don't talk about. You don't think about it. In any disaster, public space here, at least in the city and also in the, in the state, that's where everyone goes. So, you know, and people at first couldn't go to the parks. That's one of the things I was so astonished. We couldn't go to the parks to mourn like after 9-11. Everybody would go out and, win the, you know, and be together and write letters and do memorials. And none of that was even possible. So there are many pieces of this puzzle that we need to record. It's really right, David. You're right on there. But, but, you know, I think th there is a danger that we fall back into sort of complacency about these things. And, you know, it, it, there's, a, there's a kind of a policy slash budget problem, both with, uh, I always think about parks, open, public open space and libraries, for example, where we understand viscerally the importance they have socially, the importance of libraries to our education, to important public space to our public health and mental health and so on. But th in a way, they're not 
as quantifiable as picking up the trash and all the other things. So when, when Eric and Sue are talking to their pres respective leaders, you know, is the, I guess my question is, is there something in the research that they can use that will help quantify, put it into tangible yeah. terms that the budget people can actually respond to? I mean, there is ethnography in here, and as, and as many of you in the audience know, and David knows, that that's, that is sort of my method. And in fact, one of the things the book has is a, a test, a toolkit for the ethnographic study of space that you can use. Any community member, all of you in the audience, I'm hoping you're going to come use the test and study your own parks and decide and use the framework and make them better or or see what kinds of problems you have. So that the ethnography really can be vital. But uh, the, the book also offers you quantitative evidence um, that would hold up in, in policy meetings because you, there you are- ha you, you haven't met Sue's budget uh, director yet. I'm so. ready to meet Sue's budget. I've got hard numbers in here as well. So, but can I, can I say something about that? You know, it's one thing to, to look at the statistics, let's say, about uh, physical health outcomes, let's say, from the use of parks or streets or whatever. And there are some incredible numbers that say it makes all the difference. I think it's another thing to be able to show someone through listening to someone speak, and actually Eric and I have talked about this, to hear people in a park talk about why they're there and why they're exercising there or why they're walking there and what it means to them and what it feels like. And I guess also part of my goal would be to begin to educate our policy makers and our decision makers that there are different kinds of data, different kinds of research and evidence that one is statistical, representational, you know, and, it, it rep, and you can generalize. But there is also a deeper understanding of why something is happening. Why is it so? How is it that parks are so valuable? What is it that goes on in it? And, then, and that's, the, that's the role of the academic, I guess, to say there are things happening here that David, that, student, that can be designed for, that can be fomented, that make more successful spaces, that isn't always quantitative, that is also qualitative, and we need to know that, because ultimately feelings of belonging, feelings of inclusion, feelings of social justice, feelings of well-being, these aren't things that are always measurable in the kind of way you might want it well, to that, be. Well, that, that's the challenge, isn't it? That, yeah. that quantitative research is up against, uh, you know, qualitative research is up against quantitative data, right. and, it's, and it can be a struggle, but I don't know if you guys have thoughts well, about I just, that. I just wanted to add, and I'm pick up, so I, th I think that's right. I think the, 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 those personal stories are very critical that comes out in ethnography. I think that, that, that's the power of ethnography because it's something you can relate to, but, but picking around Sue's point about how COVID in some ways was a gift to the park system, right? The park system doesn't always break the surface of people's awareness, right? And, and so, and at state parks, we had the, in some ways, the last eight year of state parks was 2008 during the financial crisis, right? You talk about memory, and, and at that point, there was a proposed to close 90 parks. And people went crazy, and every legislator in the state heard from their constituents saying, you cannot do this. So we broke through, and, and we've sort of been riding that, and then COVID has helped to sort of reinforce it. I mean, you would never want COVID to come back, but there is this kind of silver lining that has that has put people the parks in people's consciousness so in some ways i find in terms of the elected who who, who control our budgets right who, who who allocate what we have um those moments where parks are so clearly in focus is when you really make a lot of progress and get those sustaining resources but at the same time i think there's so many other things parks do that that aren't that are really subterranean, like being places of work. No, I mean that nobody thinks about, uh, let's move outside of New York City for just, just a moment and go global, you know. 60% of people globally work in the informal sector. What do we mean by the informal sector? People vending and selling things and having little restaurants on the street and all that. 60, sometimes people say 80, but in the total world, that's how many people are. And where do you think the workplace is for all those people? Public space, it's parks, streets, sidewalks. 
We don't ever think about it. Again, we w disaster, crisis, where are the triage camps? We don't even think about it. What about um, sustainability? Do people, I guess, I guess there is more attention on our parks and our trees as a way to you know, increase eco-services um, and reduce heat islands in the city. But how many people think about that like on a regular basis? Or issues of creativity and socialization in kids. I think it's taken for granted. And yet we talk a lot about schools and we don't talk about what's really going on with kids and nature and playgrounds and developing and you know, socio-motor creative development. I mean, there, there's just, I guess, I think COVID taught us that anything can happen in parks and our sociality and sense of loneliness and mental well-being. But I guess I'm hoping that the book will also communicate that there is a lot more that, that public space does that is incredibly valuable, especially if we think globally and not just in terms of, say, New York City. Well, and I, I think that's where that's part of my role and our role is to think broadly, to help people think broadly about those benefits of public spaces. That it's not, it's not just, you know, it's not just the truth, it's not just one thing. It's about public health, it's about sustainability, it's about well being, it's about public safety, it's about places for community building. Um, and, you know, that, and, and it's, and, that's why books like this are so important. That's why advocacy is so important. It's electeds hearing from their constituents that no parks matter. Um, we, I have felt, um, please, you've seen a growing constituency around parks and open spaces that wasn't there before. A willingness for people to come out and stand on the steps of City Hall. And that's a good thing. That's what we need. We need people to, you know, vote with their feet and really be out there and pounding the tables about parks are critical infrastructure. They're just as important as our streets and everything else in the city. Um, we, and that's the messaging that we need. We need to be clearly delivering and making those um, uh, connections for people about the different ways parks and open space matter, but also inspiring people to come out and, and, and be part of that um, fight for the importance of supporting, funding public space. Okay, here, here. <laughs> um, I, I did want to get at some point to the issue of uh, governance. And I mean, you both manage large park systems and one of the ways that's often accomplished is by um, employing conservancies to subcontract, like Central Park Conservancy, Prospect Park Alliance, and so on. I, I can't think of an example at the state level. But a lot of people criticize, well, you know, that's just government, you know, giving up their responsibility, privatizing, you know, giving it away. Um, what's your position on that, both of you? Um, I'll start. So. Um, <laughs> You know, our, our, the, the kind of the most well-known model that people think about are the Central Parks and the Prospect Park Alliance. And, you know, we have to think about that's a 35, 40-year history, and they grew out of a time coming out of the fiscal crisis of the 70s when the city had abandoned their parks, and they were in such terrible state of disrepair. It's hard for people to imagine, but, you know, boarded up windows in, in both Central Park and Prospect Park, and it was really community people coming together and saying, you know, this is absolutely absolutely not right and we these spaces need to be cared for and it was government and the community coming together uh, you know the first thing that was done was an administrator was appointed by the city um, that was my predecessor at Prospect Park was Tupper Thomas and one for Central Park and you know there was a recognition that we need to act and work locally to build a constituency of support since that time you know fast forward 30 35 years later um, we have at the Parks Department Department invested heavily in supporting that kind of grassroots effort. We have our Partnerships for Parks Division that is it is specifically targeted towards helping to build friends of groups um, around those parks outside of the larger parks that don't have that same kind of constituency of maybe of donors or support, but we can supply tools, we can provide um, information about advocacy and how you work with your elected officials. So I really see it as a continuum of, we've got the smaller grassroots organization, friends of groups that are supported by um, our partnerships for parks division, 
again, a good thing coming out of COVID. Um, there was a, another coalition forum, the Parks and Open Space Partners. Um, there was a green fund that was created. A group of foundations thankfully came together. There was a lot of money that rushed in during COVID to support arts organizations and museums. Um, thankfully, uh, a group of um, foundations came together and formed the Green Fund. And the Green Fund has evolved now. They've given out $8 million, and they are supporting this Parks and Open Space Coalition that's 35, 40 different friends of groups, organizations that are smaller in nature, that are spread across the five boroughs. Um, and so I really think of it as, you know, the Parks Department has really benefited from having you know, for one, just an incredible culture of support. Uh, I, I talk about it all the time. There's no other city agency, I don't think, DDC or, or DOT, people, uh, you know, they're willing to come out and support a public good like they are willing to support parks. It's extraordinary. So our role is to help to cultivate those groups at all levels and make sure that support is um, being spread across the boroughs and in areas of high need so that we're equitably supporting parks in different areas. Well, th that, that's kind of the challenge, isn't it? Because a lot yep. of people perceive, well, you know, Central Park's doing really well, they've got all that money, and then you go out to the outer boroughs and the parks are not doing in such great shape. So how do you, is there a system of redistribution or how do you ensure that equity applies? So that is where, you know, through like supporting the grassroots organizations, um, through our partnerships for Parks Division, where we're providing the wherewithal to be able to um, build those friends of groups in, you know, whether it be, you know, friends of Fort Greene Park, um, uh, uh, Willowbrook Park, Park friends of group in Staten Island, really being um, holistic and thinking about where we can um, provide and help enable that support across the city. Um, and then, you know, the Central Park Conservancy does, you know, in addition to taking care of Central Park, they take care of uh, historic Harlem parks for us as well. They have really spread their support um, broadly. Um, they have a five borough crew that is targeted towards helping. Um, uh, they were in St. Mary's Park last year. They're in Highbridge this year. So. Um, working together with some of our partners to be able to spread the support as broadly and as equitably as we can. And I would, and, and I would just add, I think, and and the state obviously, you know, uh, the city is in a particular position because of the density of the population, the wealth of the city, right? These these conservancies are possible at a scale and an order of magnitude that they're not. But I, I do, but but I think what you said about the grassroots groups and, and the fact. You know these these partnerships. Partnerships are something I've as to, uh, I've emphasized a lot as commissioner, and I think that they, um, you know, that they make they, they they weave you into the community, right? They make sure you know that these these people are willing to volunteer. Many of them, right? By having these relationships, you're weaving yourself into a community, making sure you're not sort of in your ivory tower. And then when you need advocacy, when, when, the, when your budget's under fire, those, things, those are the people that come out for you. So it's a different scale, but very much, I believe, in those, in those, in those groups. But you're totally right. And I'll say, I'll just add another sort of complicated thing about it, is obviously you have the public awareness of them, but your staff also has to deal with these conservancies, and they can be, you know, there can be resentment because, they, because your staff feels like, who are these people directing what I'm supposed to be doing? But I think, I think it's healthy, because it, in some ways it goes to your, your notion of, of conflict as actually a healthy thing. But the more, the more interested stakeholders we have in these parks, it's only the better for the parks. But I like the plural, stakeholders. I mean, I'm, I'm a little more critical about the privatization of management of parks, and I, I do write in the book about the history um, from the 70s, and um, in fact, I think a lot of the trauma, I literally think the trauma of the 70s has followed us into the present. Um, and that it was up to citizens to take over our parks and gardens, and that created all our wonderful community garden movement. I mean, all kinds of incredible grassroots things came from that. And to some degree, I really support it. It's not that I don't. It's, it's that communities are complex. When we talk about this, it's as if there's one community, and there often isn't. And there's often multiple communities with very different goals. And sometimes one group's goals become more or less important to other groups. Um, let's say I did a, a 
One of my uh, graduate students, now an uh, environmental planner, you know, Dana Taplin, wrote his dissertation on Prospect Park. And one of the things that he was looking at in that dissertation, which is now, what, we worked on Prospect Park 20 years ago, probably, um, was that decision making by a conservancy, even if there is a, a board or a blue ribbon panel, can definitely be swayed by what we call white professional values. Let's, and that um, when we talk about recognition of difference in terms of justice, let's say, there is a kind of sense in our parks or in parks in general that there are these kind of behavioral norms that go, the unstated, the, the, the pieces of how you're supposed to behave that, that in fact don't hold true for everybody who's in a park. And so I always worry, and I have certainly documented examples where a conservancy or a bid or um, a partnership of some kind might really give one group heavy, uh, uh, prioritize one group over another. Because again, the more marginal you are economically, the more jobs you may have to work and the more you know, you don't have the extra time to participate in the Friends. I mean, I remember back to when we were working in Van Cortlandt and Pelham Bay and um, Prospect Park. And Prospect Park had a lot more person power, just person power in the neighborhood. So I, I think, I, I really do, I really am advocating for more support of the public sector that we don't move into a position where everything needs to somehow be funded by, by private individuals because some of those are grassroots leaders and, and will give us the, the, the best and most complicated view of what's going on. But many times it's not that. I, I want to say it's not that simple. You know, anthropologists love to say it's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated, but it's It needs, compl needs more research, I think, is the answer. Yeah, it needs more research that, that sometimes one set of values overtakes the other and, and become dominant, and, and that is a problem. For social justice, that's a problem. It, it's not just, you know, you, you, stakeholders. How, how do we get everyone to the table when some are working three jobs? How do we, how do we include mothers with... You know, it might be interesting, Sue was talking about uh, Prospect Park Alliance's um, community committee. So uh, how does that work? And, and does that, is that really representative of the diverse populations, Little Caribbean to... Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And that, you know, is an important part of um, the whole founding of the community committee. And um, it's incredibly diverse. And as I said, it is, you know, um, uh, the, someone from the community committee sits on the board of the alliance. So there is that pipeline. The other thing I would say is none of these conservancies are setting policy for parks, that oh. it's not, you know, that's not part of, I, you know, I know that because I good. ran the I Prospect didn't. Park Alliance, um, and we would always say, you know, we're not setting policy, we're not setting the speed limits in the park, we're not setting, you know, the use of scooters or not in the parks, that's not the, that's not the role of the conservancy, not setting policy. Um, but I do absolutely agree with you, Seth, that at the end of the day, I say this all the time, it is about having enough funding for the boots on the ground of the parks department. I mean, that has to be job one, absolutely. It's been you know, it's a, an incredible history of, you know, um, willingness for people to come out and volunteer and support parks, but we need the, the resources at the end of the day to support all parks across the city. And also the support for your workers, as you were saying during yeah. COVID, one of the yeah. things you and Eric are not talking about and that I do try to address in the book is all the different kinds of people who work in the park and some of those work are your, your workers in the park of all different levels from, and, and are they getting the adequate support and uh, how many end up being part-time and all kinds of things that have to do with work and workplace and public space that also come into this. Um, Eric, so uh, on this issue of um, increasing the sort of direct relationship with communities that go beyond just your staff, are there ways that the state is able to to parallel that idea? Uh, it, you know, we, with some, we obviously we have, you know, we have a footprint of eight parks in New York City, and then we have parks in the communities. But a lot of our parks are sort of destination day trip parks, and. Uh, and, and Lake Welch, and, and they're and they're so it's difficult, right, to reach that constituency that actually is in Lake Welch on a weekend. They don't, 
you know, they don't live nearby. They live in the Bronx or they live in northern Manhattan. So uh, actually, you know, you're, 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 you're totally right, Setha, and, and that is why, you know, it is important that we invest in places like Lake Welch, uh, which is not got the kind of cachet of, of, of Jones Beach or Central Park, you know, these parks that, that sort of demand attention. Uh, and so you're right that we do need to keep investing there. I think, you know, some places like a Jones Beach, you know, we have, we have friends groups, but that's partly because you have businesses there, the business, the, the, the you know, the, the Rotary Club, the civic, the civic, the civic, the civic groups are interested in Jones Beach because it's, you know, there's, there's so many eyeballs there, there's places people to sell things to, right, so you end up having more of an interest. It is definitely a challenge, it's definitely a challenge, and I would say, you know, you know, last summer, uh, Lake Welch was closed uh, because it, uh, we had a, a harmful algal bloom, and it's a, it's a beach about 30 miles north of the city, it gets 20,000 people a weekend, and it was closed, and closed, from, it closed like tragically and painfully like July 1st, and it's never open all summer. But it's, a, and it was a community, it serves a community on weekends that is, that is voiceless to some degree, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it is a Spanish-speaking constituency, very vibrant, generations going there, um, but it but it didn't get above the radar, right? You know, people people didn't know about it, right? It was sort of that, that is the, that is the, that is the thing is, as a leader, as a, as a, as administrator, um, keeping focus on those parks that really serve people that don't have the same kind of ability to draw attention is is vitally important, incredibly important to our jobs and, and, and what we do. And I think it's hard to figure that out. Yeah. I mean, I still think it's hard. And. Yeah. I think, though, that's one interesting thing when we talk about changes with COVID and with so much mov moving online. The Parks Department does an awful lot. You know, any project before we start, it starts with a community input session to get input on a design and what we're looking to do. Um, now, that so, now that that can happen via Zoom or via Teams meeting does make it so that we can get a whole lot more participation. We had a meeting regarding the African Barrow Ground in Brooklyn um, this week, and we had 140 people signed up for a meeting. If we, if that was a 6.30 meeting during the week that you had to come to, we wouldn't have had moms with kids who are trying to get dinner on the table or working three jobs. You know, that's one change that I think is positive out of COVID is we're able to gather more input from communities that we wouldn't have heard from or from constituency or stakeholders um, that we wouldn't have heard from that now technology, interestingly, does allow for, and people are used to it, and, and, and our participating in that way and it does draw in more people which has been fascinating yeah. and Eric has a big you have a big job and you know we've done the public space research has done research for for Eric and his parks not just for the city and also for the National Park Service um, because sometimes it isn't possible to reach out and to get it helps to get a snapshot of knowing who's there and what the issues really are but then there's a whole other piece of how do you get to them and yet, you know, during COVID, we also learned, we definitely learned that some parts of New York City have a lot of public space. There was lots of places to go and get out of the apartment, and there are other areas where there really was not. And the difference in the health statistics also represented that. So um, it really, sh you know, it, it, we've learned, we learned a lot. Some of it not all so pretty, I mean, in terms of um, the distribution and equity in public space uh, accessibility during, during COVID. Well, I, I think I'd like to open it up to the audience if there are any questions from our visitors tonight. Yes, sir, that man over there had his hand up. So if, you, if you can come up to the mics in the aisle, that's probably gonna be the best way. Yes, it should be. Uh, well, first, thank you all very much. Um, it's really a terrific session. Uh, book sounds great. Um, I'd like to. You mean you haven't read it yet? Um, I wanted to ask you about something. Uh, two things that um, did not come up in the discussion, about which um, I believe there may be a fair amount of ambivalence um, in the city, uh, and that is the proliferation of bike lanes and outdoor restaurant seating. Both of which N using not specifically. Public space. Yeah, uh, well, Setha, maybe they're not specifically park things, but you've well, talked I mean, a little I bit do, about I mean, I do talk about, I mean, but I did it too early. I mean, I, really complicated. On the outdoor seating, um, I at first really felt that the, you know, the liberalization during COVID 
at, in, from the interviews that I was um, doing, um, also created a liberalization for vendors. In other words, at the same moment that you could have more cafes on the streets, that put more pressure on the city to allow more vendors who make their livelihoods and who are, uh, it's a way to integrate into the economy here in New York um, were granted. And um, my comment on that is that, you know, during COVID we realized and recognized we can live in streets that way, um, but we can also enliven streets um, through, as I said, vending and other kinds of sidewalk activities. On the other hand, um, bike lanes, I'm not getting into. Somebody else has to get into bike lanes, but uh, we have a ways to go with the bike Yeah, and I think that we, we're now facing what we're going to do with all the restaurant, outside restaurant structures, and I think this is an issue, and I think I don't have all the answers. I would have to do research. Well, I can, I can tell you what the, what the city is planning on doing, which is to um, develop design guidelines governing the construction of the so-called restaurant sheds um, so that they are better looking, more, you know, more secure, and also removable if they have to do street work and so on, and also uh, imposing a fee on those people that actually use that public space. So I think those two changes, if we're moving toward a permanent arrangement for this, the cafe sheds is probably a step in the right but direction. But do we need them in winter? Well, of course we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, okay, so <laughs> does anybody want to address bike lane, biking, cycling in general? I mean, it's obviously growing apace. I think it's a, it's a, it's a theme that all the issues we've been talking about here could be, could be could be put into, right? You have user conflict, talk about the, the motorized vehicles, the electric bikes, the, you know, the congestion on the West Side Highway with people, you know, the Hudson River Park, that craziness. But on the other hand, the explosion of bike lanes and, and getting people out is, is nothing but a good thing. And, and, and getting people out exercising and getting out of the subways or getting out of their cars is, is all good. And when we, you know, Seth pointed to inequalities in access to space and bike lanes and greenways in particular help people to get to and access, you know, beautiful public spaces that would otherwise be harder to get to. So um, they're really important in that aspect in terms of equitable access to space. It's an easy route, easy ways for people to access great public space. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to, I would really like to see a lot more network public space. I mean, I think the Parks Without Borders movement made a lot of sense, but let's think really Parks Without Borders, and that includes state parks. I don't know how it works for state parks, but to open up the park into the community and to, to again, begin to network things together, that'll make things different. Um, Lance, I believe you uh, had a question. Uh, Lance Brown, uh, architect, urbanist. Um, well, you know, I have a, a number of comments I'd like to make. Um, but the, the biggest one is based on the title of the evening's talk, which is the future of public space. And I've heard an awful lot about the past of public space and the currency of public space. But I think what I would find exciting from the, the four of you are things that we in the audience aren't really aware of that are perhaps, you know, uh, in the back room being discussed about what are we really going to do going forward. Not, we all know public space is wonderful. That case has been made and we value it. COVID increased its value. But uh, I know people who come to New York who question things about the public spaces we have here. I'll give you one example, an easy one, which opens another realm, which is Moynihan Hall. There's not a person I know who hasn't gone through Moynihan Hall and said, why can't I sit down? Why, why, why do I have to stand for four hours and the same thing with New Jersey Transit? What's the future of that? The other is, not, and this is a pet peeve of mine that some of you know, generally when we talk about open space, what we hear about is parks. Now, I love parks like everybody, but I'm really more concerned in the city about uh, squares and piazzas and plazas and, par and hard spaces which have a whole other realm of concern and consideration with everything in terms of use and propriety. So um, I, I've thought uh, um, often that New York lacks 
open gathering spaces that are not restricted. I had actually hoped the 9-11 memorial site, 1608 acres, would be a big open space. And then it got filled with little pieces of lawn and trees. And then if you go there, there's a big sign that says, no gathering, no singing, no standing, no lying down, no talking to too many people at one time. And I, and I know there's a park, a Hargraves Park in Texas that says, no breastfeeding, things you know that you can't, you know, so there's culture. But again, what I'd love to hear are a couple of things that you might say that don't have to do with the current state, but have to do with things we're not yet aware of that are gonna change the future of the space we have in this city. Well, Lance, you should have come to the uh, panel discussion we had at Pratt, where we talked about not parks, but public space in general, but there you go. This is, this is a little bit of a, <laughs> tonight is, the Fox, is a fox night. <laughs> um, I, I would just say, and I'll, and I'll hand it over to the others, I, I think probably the biggest transformation we're gonna see in the next decade or two in New York City is the waterfront. The continuing transformation of the waterfront from its old industrial <coughs> uses to public access and public recreation. It's, we've done a lot in the past, 10 and 20 years, there's a lot more still to come, and I think that's gonna be the biggest physical addition to our public space in, in the future. But I'll hand it over to our panel. Thank you. Um, great question. I would agree with David. I think that what's going on in the waterfront already, and it will continue to evolve, providing access to the waterfront for New Yorkers in a way that we have not had before, especially along the east side and the FDR Drive. And it's really extraordinary, and we're giving a lot of thought to how we can connect those spaces, which is complicated because you have things like the UN and buildings in the way and things like that. But I think one, um, yes, is waterfront access, waterfront property. I think seeing more and more spaces that are dual purpose, that are both, you know, they're green spaces, but they're also sponge parks. So they're also helping us to deal with the challenges that we're facing of climate change. And, you know, how can we make, and it's, it's, that's complicated, right? Because it's like we need them for recreation and for a park specific use, but they also realistically, we need to be able to absorb the stormwater. See, that was kind of a quick, a trick question to get us to the biggest thing that will happen is everything to do with climate change, of yes. course. We're gonna rebuild the whole city and yes. the open space will be at the core of that reconstruction and the buildings. But yeah, right. yeah, no, and I Absolutely. think that's true. I think the future of everything is going to be that we are really taking into consideration climate change and I think that we're going to see the lack, you know, I think we're going to see asphalt turned into greenways, and I think we're going to see networking that my, you know, I've been dreaming about networking parks for a long time, and once we've closed the streets, right? Once those streets get closed long enough, I, yeah. we're going to dig them up, and we're going to turn, the, you know, get rid of the asphalt, and um, I, that's what I see, and or at least that's what, I, and that's something we can do all over. It doesn't have to be a Manhattan-focused oh, thing. Oh no! That we could be taking up the streets and um, having more gardens, and you know, really taking the lessons of the the real lessons of the '70s, bringing them back now. That's why it's so exciting. Something like what you're seeing happening in Queens and Jackson Heights with 34th Avenue. It's an extension of Traverse Park. They've closed, you know, it, and it started with the street being closed and having an open street and now actually being greened and you know having DOT and parks working together to add greening elements and the community coming together to help to take care of it creating a linear park um, along you know a whole stretch of 34th Avenue I think that's a really exciting model for what's to come absolutely yeah, and I think that's true for the state parks. We, you know, we are the largest shoreline owner in the state of New York, uh, state parks are, so we are facing that at Jones Beach, all those barrier islands that people love so much. So, so I, think, but I, think, I think the parks offer, so going forward, um, that is key, right? Sustainability and, 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 and resilience. And I think the great thing about parks is you do have the opportunity, we have these great resources that are great for addressing climate change and are great for modeling the best kind of response to climate change, right? You know, you model stuff and so and it's, and it's, it is about, about natural systems, building natural systems to help protect our, our communities. It's also about solar, you know, renewable energy. I mean, there's a lot of things because of all the visitors we have, you have this enormous ability to, um, to, to model the best behavior and model our evolution into a green, a green economy and a green support. 
And I think the other thing I would see for us is just, what I, I view personally as important is continue to make sure our parks are there for every constituency, right? Because as, as you said, it is sort of where democracy happens and where, where people become Americans. I thought that was very powerful, some of the chapters where people sort of feel like they are Americans in our parks and as we continue to have immigration and we need to always make sure that people see themselves among our workers, that there's activities, you know, we've got pressure to put in, you know, cricket and, 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 <laughs> and lots of different things that we've never had to do before and that's, that's the exciting thing about being in parks now. You said beaches though, about 90%, maybe 98% of all New York um, beaches, New York, uh, Long Island beaches are private. So Jones Beach is but a drop in the bucket, just so you know, just to keep it in mind. <laughs> I'm in the the next book. It'll never go private. <laughs> it better not. I said, that's my next book, so Eric knows he's on. <laughs> uh, yes, next question, thank you. Yeah, your title, The Future of Public Spaces in New York City. So there's a whole segment that nobody's talked about because we're from the parks here. And there's a segment of areas that where developers get to put extra space for creating a park. Who's responsible for making sure that they care of it? For example, on uh, First Avenue between 34th and 35th Street, there's a park because the developer got more space when they turned the Coca-Cola plant into an apartment building. Now, Sweet Green is also, all of a sudden on the corner, they've commandeered the public space. Who allows that? Who's responsible for protecting the public so that these spaces aren't commandeered? The developer should be responsible for taking care of this park. They should have a template for how the park needs to be cared for with seating and other facilities, there's nothing like that. So this, this developer just did nothing there. Now there's seats and things like that. Then who's responsible for knowing who's getting the money from Sweet Green? How is it going to be used? And why is Sweet Green there paying the money when the developer will have that space forever? And who's responsible for taking care of that? No, that, that, that's a good question, and, and he's referring to this program, it's called Privately Owned Public Spaces, where developers get additional square footage to build buildings, provided they donate a public space, um, uh, which, which is privately owned, but open to the public. And there are two people involved. The uh, Department of City Planning promotes design guidelines that enforce uh, the amount of seating that's required, the amount of vegetation, the square footage, and so on that the developer has to comply with when the space is built. Thereafter, it's the responsibility of the Department of Buildings to ensure that the place is not privatized and not, uh, and not changed. Now, th the weakness there is that the Department of Buildings lacks the resources really necessary to maintain that adequate policing. And there had been private groups. Um, Gerald Caden had been leading that group of sort of private vigilantes, if you like, that went around and sort of reported back to the Department of Buildings if they saw violations. That, I think, has, has lost some of its power in recent years. And I think developers are getting away with stuff that they right. shouldn't be getting away with. And That's I think, 20 you know, years ago. And I think people like you yeah. should bring it to their attention, you know. There was a lot of, there's been a lot of research, actually, really good research, but it was really hot, 2000, 2007, 2008, 2009, and then it seems to have stopped really demonstrating how unwelcoming and uh, not public these pops are. And um, Well, some of them are very good, actually. It depends a lot. It's few. at the whim of the developer is the problem. Yeah. Um, but there are too many that are not. I think that's really the problem, and we don't. I mean, I think it's a really good point. I didn't realize, David, it was the Department of Buildings. So this is something to take on, and this a public voice would be really helpful. This is something we shouldn't just let go. We need to keep working on. So you're saying neither government agency is doing their job? Well, well I, I think Department of City Planning uh, does apply the design criteria successfully. I think that part is probably okay. It's the it's what happens afterwards. It's the management, the privatization, the introducing concessions, restaurants and so on that, that is not, I think, being adequately policed at this point. And the city really needs to up its game in that. The aspect. large dogs. 
Well, is it okay if there was never seating there or never greenery or just concrete? No, there's generally seating required, and if there isn't, then, you know, there should be. I think your point's very well taken, so thank you. Yes, please, go ahead. Hi. Uh, there was a talk before about the difficulties of trying to quantify the qualitative benefits of parks. And I don't have a question, but I really want to draw your and everybody else's attention to a study put out last year by the Trust for Public Land, which does, in fact, try to quantify all of the qualitative benefits that are uh, generated by visits to parks, of which there are 527 million visits to parks in New York City, more than state parks, by the way, if you count all of the visits. Health benefits, reduction in crime, uh, uh, psychological benefits, they attempt to, through a complex series of evaluations, try to put a dollar value on that, and everybody should look at it, downloadable free from the trust, tpl.org, and uh, you know they try to do that because to defend the parks and to get the funding that you need, you need to consider them as an asset that the city budget needs to take into account, that it needs to care for its assets, and the parks are very valuable. Oh, good. A lot of others. It also has, for those of you interested, all, uh, all different organizations all over the world that both do assessments and the instruments they use to assess parts. I really saw this as a handbook. For, oh, sorry, sorry. I really, I, I was saying it cites a lot of um, these reports as evidence, but it also offers you um, a whole list of all the organizations globally that go out and try to evaluate public space and are doing and producing this material with websites. And if you go to the Public Space Research Group website, there are links to many of these reports and um, also tools for going out and looking at the public space right outside your door. Um, I really saw this as a way to open open the door to anyone I, and anyone to try to do their own research, their own ethnography, to go out and look and then to bring that material back to us. Because I think that that's what we need. It's just what Susan and Eric are saying. I mean, we need everyone to really, we need everyone to help us. And um, I was hoping that this book would both make the case that it was important in these incredible ways um, to have a future, as Lance is saying, and also that we're part of it and that we need to do the hard work. Nobody, they're not gonna do it alone. Um, they can't do it alone, to be honest. And none of us can do it alone. So I also tried to offer tools in it um, that you can use to go and look at your own local park and understand what's going on there and count, if you will, or you know, listen to people's stories and bring that back and understand what's going on there and how we can all make it better. Okay, thank you. On that note, I was told that to... Note, I would just like to address something, because <laughs> it was bothering me, I apologize. I wasn't really expecting to come into this meeting. But what you just said is very, very valuable. If you want to get to know your park, your community park, and realize its history, and then understand its usefulness, and then perhaps count the amount of laughter from the children within it, and then also find out that it's going to be stolen and taken away. That's what's happening to the Elizabeth Street Park. So just as she has spoken, I invite you all, because I'm very much into that park because I've traveled around and lived in Europe, and if you close your eyes and look at a small park, because we're not talking about a huge park, you're talking about a park that when you close your eyes, you was as, it's as if you are in the park from the extended palace of the Medici in Renaissance Italy. Now, I'd been there, and that's what drew me into the park. How that developed, what it's about now, it's for you to see. It's also about for you to learn, like you have suggested. Look upon your community, see what should be cherished in your community, and do not allow a developer to come in to feel that he could make another park that would be able to take the place 
of the one that I'm explaining. So I beg of you to do that. And again, it's the Elizabeth Street Park. So it's in the East Village, and you'll be amazed. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, well. All right, uh, so everybody think, out to their parks. Yes, absolutely. Get ready to do your, buy your book, <laughs> get your ethnography, support 1% uh, for parks. Another question. No, I think, I think we have to, uh, I was told to wrap up at 8.45 and it's 8.50, so I think we're going to Support your parks. Move on. I, I want to thank everybody that came. I want to thank everybody that was on Zoom. I want to thank uh, Eric and Susan and uh, Setha for a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, David.